Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my great pleasure to, to welcome uh, Boris here to, to give, a, <coughs> give a talk. Boris is uh, currently halfway through a postdoc with uh, Babak Falsafi's group at uh, EPFL. And before that, he, worked, uh, he did his PhD at UT Austin on on-chip interconnects. And uh, they've been doing some very interesting stuff uh, on the grounds of how do you redesign hardware for data center workloads and especially analytics, which is of great interest to us from the software side. So I thought we'd bring him here and he'd tell us uh, what they're doing. So over to you, Boris. Thank you very much for the introduction. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming to the talk. All right, so uh, today I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the inefficiencies in uh, today's data centers, um, sort of some of the challenges that are facing future data centers, and um, you know, at least sort of some of the research, some of the ideas we've been throwing out there uh, as ways to try to overcome you know, some of these challenges and inefficiencies. Okay, so you know, I don't need to tell you uh, sort of our world in the midst of a kind of big transformation, right? We have lots and lots of you know mobile network devices that you know people are using to access sort of vast, vast data stores that are uh, kind of well distributed, right? Now, what's really powering this revolution are large-scale data centers that are used to store, process, and serve the information to a distributed. Uh, sort of global user base. Now, one kind of fundamental characteristic of these data centers is that they are large. They're big, right? So thousands, if not tens of thousands of servers, you know, easily costing hundreds of millions of dollars with power budgets often exceeding tens of megawatts. Now, why is this happening? Again, I understand you guys know this, but, you know, just a quick review. Uh, sort of, you know, the data sets are really massive. Offline processing for this data uh, are, again, often very considerable. Online processing in response to each and every query are also, uh, you know, really intensive in many cases. Then you have redundancy requirements, a bunch of other things, and really what you come down to is that, you know, in order to serve this really large data to a big user base, you know, it's really efficient to do things at very large scale, right? So it's efficiency. Types of applications, you know, web search, media streaming, social connectivity, and so forth. And so these are what we call scale-out apps, right? Very quick review, what does this mean? You know, kind of the way we think of it is uh, there are three fundamental characteristics for scale-out, right? So there are many independent requests or tasks, so there's significant request-level parallelism, right? We have a huge data set that is uh, distributed across many nodes or sharded, okay? And then there's minimal communication among the servers. And so what's really important to understand is that the latter two properties, this distributed data set and minimal communication uh, among the servers is basically a, an enabler to exploit this very rich request level parallelism fairly inexpensively, okay? In other words, we can do the scale out as opposed to the scale up model. Okay, so applications, large data centers kind of what are the you know, implications at the data center level? Again, keeping this super high level for a moment, right? So again, we have this vast sharded data set across many, many servers, right? The uh, workloads are typically, the data uh, is typically memory resident. Uh, this is obviously done for performance reasons because it's actually a really expensive uh, sort of optimization to do. It's expensive in terms of uh, uh, you know, acquisition costs, memory is expensive. Uh, it turns out that in large quantities, memory is also a major power burden. Okay, but, but you know, this is something that, that people do, uh, kind of you bite the bullet uh, in order to get the performance to where it needs to be. Okay, and then you have the processors that essentially access and kind of mine this data in memory. Okay, and so, you know, again, we, we said there's abundant request level parallelism, and so what we really want, right, are processors that can basically get us the maximum performance, you know, get us the best leverage from this expensive memory and the rest of the data center investment that we have, okay? Okay, so, you know, essentially what I'm saying is we want more performance per dollar for our data centers. Now, historically, this was actually fairly easy to do, at least over time, and if you're a data center operator, all you had to do 
was basically weight, you got higher performance within the same data center, you can accommodate more users, okay? This was, um, uh, this was basically enabled through uh, a pair of phenomena very nicely captured by these two gentlemen, right? So on top we have uh, Gordon Moore, who in 1965 set forth what has become known as, as Moore's law, which is that basically, you know, with each technology generation, uh, we can double the transistor density. And really what that gets us is more performance in a fixed area. Right. Roughly a decade later, the gentleman below, below Robert Denard, formulated uh, uh, the Denard theory of scaling, which basically says that if, in fact, you are able to reduce the size of the transistors, and at the same time you manage to scale the voltage, uh, what ends up happening, kind of bottom line, right, and I'm sweeping a lot of stuff under the rug, but the bottom line is that, you know, as you increase the performance through more transistors, you can also increase the frequency, but your, your, your power will stay constant, right? And so as a result of these two phenomena, what ends up happening, or used to happen in the past, is we got more performance with constant area and power, okay? So, you know, when, when these two laws are in effect, essentially if you're a data center operator, you have a particular workload today, you have a particular user base, you support it with a data center, in the future, your requirements grow, you, you need to support more users, you know, more sophisticated applications, more applications, you just swap in better servers, right? Your area requirements don't change, your power requirements don't change, and your performance improves, you know, thanks to a combination of more law and art scaling. Now, as everybody probably knows, uh, voltages aren't scaling as, we, as they used to, okay? So the art scaling has slowed down. So what I've done here to kind of show uh, uh, the trend and, and the problem uh, is I've plotted sort of two graphs. So, so the graph, uh, the green stuff, uh, so bo both lines are taken from the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. So this is basically the Bible for the uh, technology industry, the, the device people. And so the green line basically shows their prediction made in 2001. As you'll see, it starts out basically following historical ideal Dunard scaling trends, which is the dotted line. And then you'll see that the prediction is that things will start slowing down. The red line shows the reality in uh, uh, 2009, okay, which shows two things. A, the slope is shallower, okay, so that means that voltage scaling is more, uh, the slowdown in voltage scaling is more severe than initially thought. And B, it shows that compared to the original prediction made in 2001, there's actually a significant gap in voltage. And remember that, that energy and power are quadratic in voltage, they're not linear. Right, so, so basically, kind of energy not really scaling uh, well at all, okay? So, so again, kind of to put this in perspective in a very cartoonish fashion, again, sweeping lots of stuff under the rug here uh, to simplify, but basically what we have is in order to scale sort of performance requirements, uh, we essentially, or the industry is basically having to build more data centers, right? Uh, so, okay, that's, that's unfortunate, you know, Companies like Microsoft and Google effectively have to build more data centers. You know, of course, from an operating expense, that's not great, but you know, at the end of the day, maybe nobody cares. So, so kind of our position is that, well, it's not our position, this is actually, uh, uh, I think, global position, uh, is that uh, there's kind of a looming crisis, if you will, stemming from the uh, energy consumption by data centers worldwide. Okay, so, so what I'm showing in the graph on the left is a prediction for energy consumption by, made by the Energy Star uh, in, the, um, in the US in 2007. This is the blue line. Again, this is only for the US. The y-axis is in uh, billions of kilowatt hours uh, and, uh, per year. And so the prediction was made in 2007 based on past decades scaling. They made some you know, assumptions based on how various things will scale and they looked a decade ahead. And so the blue line is what they came up with, but you know, as I showed in the previous graph, historical trends were a little optimistic as compared to today's reality, right? Uh, and so what I've done to sort of show the other potential extreme, and this is really pessimistic, is I've plotted the red line, which essentially um, uh, replots the blue line assuming no voltage scaling whatsoever, which is really pessimistic. And so the truth is definitely somewhere in between these two lines, and, and I don't really know exactly where it will end up in another decade, right? But the point is that there is, you know, super linear, exponential, something like that, growth in data center energy just in the U.S. alone, right? And then when you assume 
that, you know, historically energy costs, again, at least in the U.S., I have no idea what the deal is in the U.K., uh, maybe you guys can tell me, historically, energy costs in the U.S. have been rising. Uh, you know, basically, we see exponential increase in cost, at least, you know, the numbers may be pessimistic, but the trends are definitely there. Right? And so again, with the pessimistic assumption, you know, sometime around you know, maybe a decade from now, uh, potentially data center uh, annual operating costs, power-wise, will pass $300 billion, which uh, just happens to be the GDP of Greece before the financial crisis. Okay? So you know, bottom line, exponential growth in cost of not mitigated. Oh, and another interesting data point, and this is a fact, this is not a projection, in 2010, global data center power exceeded uh, uh, that uh, of UK's output. Okay, so um, let's see. So, so kind of major, major crisis on hand, right? And so basically, you know, we have this, this growth in data. We have this growth in demand. How do we meet, the, uh, meet this in a kind of energy responsible, sustainable manner? Okay, so at the PFL, our you know, very high level vision is that there are three enablers that will require, you know, that, that will allow us to kind of support this post-Denard uh, scaling model for data centers, okay? Uh, these range from near term to definitely much further out. So kind of the nearest term, and so the three are I uh, for integration, S uh, for specialization, and A for approximation, or this is what we call the ISA for post-Denard data centers. Okay, so integration is basically, you know, that, that speaks for itself, right? You know, we want to put as much stuff as we can on a chip, on the board, you know, within a rack and so forth, right? Obviously, this is a well-known way uh, to reduce costs, right? Fewer components is cheaper. This is good for data center operators. But also, uh, from an energy perspective, uh, the, the denser things are, the less energy we have to expand moving data around. And it turns out that moving data is a really energy expensive operation, be it on a chip or across the chip or across the data center. A little farther out, we want to specialize, right? So basically, we have a certain amount of work to do. How can we do this work with less switching and less communication? And then further out, we're looking at ways to actually, you know, reduce the amount of work we do, hopefully without the end user noticing it, right? So reduce the fidelity of the result in order to dramatically reduce the amount of energy. And so this is much farther out, sort of, we started playing with this idea. Uh, what I'm going to focus on uh, uh, in the rest of this talk is our kind of early work looking at mostly integration, a little bit of specialization, and wh what I want to stress is this stuff is kind of, this is near term, right? All the technology exists now, this is off the shelf technology, it's a matter of kind of go and do this, right? There's no crazy optimization that's necessary, okay? So here's the outline for the rest of the talk. First, I'll talk about uh, existing server processors. Uh, I'll show that they're, you know, woefully inefficient. Uh, I'll then take a look at scale-out workloads, kind of what are their architectural high-level requirements that we can cater to in order to dramatically improve our efficiency at the processor level, and as I'll show, we can get phenomenal gains at the data center level as well. Okay, and so that's kind of our scale-out scale -out processor work. Okay, and, and I mean, obviously you guys can interrupt, ask questions at any point in time. <clears throat> All right, so again, starting out, Sort of, we looked at uh, efficiency of today's servers on scale-out workloads. Obviously, this requires two things. You know, we need representative applications and we need representative hardware, okay? And so we went out and we got us both of these things, okay? So for the, uh, you know, applications, we're an academic institution. Uh, you know, we love talking to you guys and, and Google and other partners, but, you know, nobody wants to share their uh, um, industrial-grade workloads. So what we did was we basically got a bunch of uh, open source applications that are in wide use today and are generally accepted to be very representative of, uh, um, of workloads that are, you know, run by the big boys. So, you know, we have data serving with Cassandra, we have MapReduce and Hadoop, uh, we have um, software testing as a cloud service via symbolic execution, we have media streaming, uh, web front end uh, on a pretty common uh, software stack, and then we have web search with Notch. Uh, now, one of the uh, very common um, pushbacks we've gotten both from Bing people and Google is that Notch is not Bing or Google. We understand that. Okay, so, you know, uh, I, I, 
we know this. Okay, so these were run on a modern version of Linux. What's really neat is because this is open source, uh, we were able to, re to you know, really nicely package this up with, uh, with load generators and so forth. And so this is actually available to researchers. Uh, you guys can download this and start playing with this now. So, okay, so that's software. Now on the hardware, we took sort of really kind of commodity off the shelf hardware from Dell. Okay, uh, sort of for the purposes of this talk, what really matters about each node configuration is two things. There's uh, 24 gigabytes of memory per node, right? And this is where the data is. And then there are two uh, conventional uh, uh, Intel Xeon processors running at almost three gigahertz, six cores, 12 megabytes. And so, you know, at least a year or two ago, the processor family, which is the Westmere, uh, was the family that Facebook used in their data centers. I don't know about the exact model, if it matches, but, but you know, we believe, again, this is really representative. Okay, so, Sort of going down a little bit now, peeking at the CPU. I don't expect you guys to be microarchitecture experts, so I'll keep this fairly high level. Um, you know, this is this is a real aggressive kind of uh, server-grade, uh, you know, big iron CPU, uh, four uh, execution units, so you can have a maximum uh, instruction level parallelism of four instructions per clock. Very large instruction window, well over 100 instru instructions, over 50 memory. Oh, sorry, almost 50 memory operations in flight. Um, Three-level cache hierarchy with uh, you know fairly sizable last-level cache of 12 megabytes. Okay, and then there are three memory controllers uh, for a total of chip bandwidth of uh, 32 gigabytes per second. Okay, so you know we did a really comprehensive evaluation with uh, uh, sort of again uh, running these up, uh, the applications I talked about on this hardware, right? So this is all hardware, no simulators. Uh, we used performance counters for the measurements. Uh, the results were published in S+, actually it was a best paper winner at this year's S+. Um, I will only focus on a couple of the results, uh, and uh, you guys can read the paper for more, or you can uh, ask questions. Uh, but the few things I wanted to point out with regard to these workloads you know, running on this uh, uh, state-of-the-art conventional hardware is that A, the application level IPC is really low. Okay, so on average, at best, we're executing one instruction per cycle. Okay on average. Now, why is this happening? Well, it's because the workloads are memory dominant, right? Most of the processing is really just fetching the data from memory with a little bit of number crunching, right? And so a lot of the workloads are actually traversing recursive data structures. So there is sort of data level serialization where you basically have to go get a piece of data, crunch on it, then you issue the next memory request. So lots of time is spent in the memory hierarchy, especially in the memory itself, low instruction level parallelism, low memory level parallelism, okay? So, you know, kind of going back to our processor picture, right, what we see is that the execution resources are terribly underutilized. The large instruction window, we're not able to mine it for ILP, so this really power expensive, power expensive machinery, you know, is burning us lots of power, but is not really de delivering what we want it to, and we have very low memory level parallelism as well, okay? Now, kind of looking a little bit sort of further, you know, away from the, from the execution resources, looking at the, at the large last level cache, right, what we find is that uh, the cache is actually not very effective either. So what we're doing here is we're comparing the scale out workloads to a traditional, you know, spec and application. Yeah. Can I have a quick question? Yeah. The, the low parallelism, right? This is instruction level parallelism. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This, this is. Yeah, th th this is what I said earlier, right? Lots of request level parallelism. No, 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 no. No, the, the cores are wrong. That's what we're saying. The, it, it's, it's the processor that's wrong for the software, right? So, yeah, so, so we'll get there. Hang in. So, so uh, right, so traditional applications, spec-int, MCF, you know, the reason we're picking MCF is, for those who know spec-int, it has a really large data set. Lots of other spec applications do not, so at least it's comparable in that sense. Uh, and so what we see, you know, uh, the, the, the performance is normalized to the full 12 megabyte LLC, right? And so what we see is, for the traditional application, performance falls off steadily as we shrink the size of the last level cache, meaning that there's actually data locality. Right. This is absolutely not the case in scale-out applications where we see that going from a 12 megabyte to just a third of a size, performance drops by less than 10%. And that's, of course, because the data is in memory and the stuff that we're really able to capture are to the first order 
just instructions and some OS data structures. And that's pretty much it. So, so again, uh, sort of less level cache, definitely underutilized. I'm not going to talk about the uh, off-chip memory bandwidth. It turns out that that's really poorly utilized as well uh, because we have just uh, you know, a small handful of cores uh, and we have very low memory level parallelism. All right. <clears throat> so kind of the bottom line, to put all of this in perspective uh, and, and, and set the stage for kind of various optimizations, is that you look at this Westmere processor, right, as six cores, so that's way too few, right? What we want to do is better, you know, get at the data that's in memory. We want to exploit the request level parallelism, right? And that's too few cores to do that. The cores are way too fat. They're way over provisioned uh, uh, given what the applications are doing. The caches are largely wasted and, and they're occupying lots of, you know, on-chip real estate. And the memory controllers, uh, again, they're largely underutilized because of low memory level parallelism from a single thread perspective. So yes? What is the bounding metric here? Is it basically we're just hitting memory all over the place and we're spending more time setting up memory transactions than we are doing anything else? Is that what absolutely bounds up? What, we've, we've hit some limits. What, what's the limit? If the bandwidth is, is still available, if the cache is poorly utilized, so, 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 so there, is, there is no fundamental limit in the results I've shown here. There is a problem, which is that you know, the processor is designed for a completely different or optimized for a different set of workloads, right? So, so in other words, what the workloads, the way the workloads are behaving is really not well catered by this processor, right? So traditional scientific applications, for instance, lots of uh, instruction level parallelism, right? They expose that, right? Lots of data movement, right? This thing will burn really well through that type of code, right? The problem here is that, you know, all of this machinery doesn't really accommodate the, the application behavior. I, I don't know if I'm answering your question, but there's no, there's, no, there's no fundamental limit. That's exactly the problem is that you have a power budget, you have, you know, area budget, and so the, the machines, you know, the, the processor is certainly built to accommodate that, but we're not coming close to hitting that, you know, on... on like something is at 100%, right? Because if, every, if one, something's hit 100%, and that's yeah. limiting our throughput. So do you know what that, what, what is that that's hit the that, that, that is maxing out, that's, that's preventing our work from scaling any further? So, so here, it's a real poor design. And so I'm going to show you a design that will take you much farther within the same constraints. Okay, so, so if I don't answer your question toward the end of the, one second. If I don't answer your question toward the end of the talk, let's come back to that, but I think I will. Please. This question is bottleneck analysis. What is the bottleneck on this traditional core? And I think what you're saying is it's not actually the bandwidth anywhere or the cache anywhere. It's the latency because you can't predict what many accesses are coming up. Is that right? So. If not, what happens? That's your question. You, you know, I think, I think, I think. If, if I can, you know, if, if I can summarize, I mean, I, I would like to think that the slide summarizes the bottom line, but I mean, to me, it's, it's that the workloads are request level parallel, right? Which basically means lots of completely independent threads, right? And that's not what this machine is made for. This machine is made for a few threads with lots of computation inside each thread, right? And so it's a total mismatch. It's not a bottleneck, it's just a mismatch, right? It's like you're trying to haul trash in a Ferrari, right? That's not what a Ferrari, you know, or to go fast in a garbage truck, right? That's just not what it's made for. So, okay, so again, if I don't answer your questions over the end, let, let's come back to this again. Okay, so, kind of went back and we asked the question of uh, what exactly do the scale-out applications actually need, right? So can, you know, that thing is really inefficient. Uh, it's not getting us anywhere near where we want to. What do the applications really need so that we can either find something better off the shelf, right? Uh, or we can build something better, okay? And so again, from an architectural perspective, right, sort of the way we see the processor is essentially doing the following, right? So we have high level, you know, we, ha we have users that are basically sending requests, requests get mapped to threads that are running on the cores, okay? And so architecturally, three things are happening, right? First, cores share instructions, so there's a common instruction set, and that can easily fit in a fairly small last level cache, right? So on the order of a few megabytes, right? The data is in memory, so the last level cache is not really helping there, and so the cores access the data in memory, right? And then the last thing is that the cores don't actually communicate because they're serving independent requests, right? The data is essentially mostly read only, and even for the few things that are shared over a large interval of time, right? So one, you know, 
you have a request which, which is a write, and then sometime later somebody reads it. Imagine Facebook update and a subsequent kind of read, right? These things happen over such large intervals of time that they're not amenable to caching on a chip, right? And so from a, from a single sort of processor perspective, you know, there's essentially no read write sharing, no communication. Okay, so, you know, again, we saw that the traditional processor doesn't really work well on this type of behavior, right? Few cores, cores are overly fat, cache is way over provisioned, right? Really poor. However, this is not the only processor you can buy out there. And in fact, it turns out that there are a couple of other companies, startups, at least for the moment, that are trying to build processors that specifically cater to these types of applications, okay? So, just out of curiosity, has anybody heard of Calcetta? It's a startup in Texas? Okay, a few people have. So, so, so Calcetta, and there are a couple of other ones that are getting in this build, uh, are building chips that basically have a few uh, off-the-shelf cores. It's, it's typically ARM, um, although there are also some are using MIPS, right? And so they'll have, uh, you know, two to four cores um, that are really simple, really energy efficient. You know, ARM or MIPS, this is the stuff that you'd find in like uh, today's smartphone or something. Uh, they'll share kind of a reasonably sized two, four megabyte less level cache. They'll integrate a memory controller, some other glue logic kind of die, right? So it's, it's a full SOC with a few cores, okay? And so, you know, is this good? Is this bad? Well, it turns out, and, and again, I'll have the data for all of this later on, it turns out that this is mostly not great, right? So lean cores are good, right? Because they actually get us the energy efficiency that we would like, right? So, so we don't have this massive sort of microarchitectural weight where the, the resources are way over provisioned for the job. That's the good news. The bad news is there are very few of these cores, so it's really difficult to amortize all this other stuff on a chip like the cache. There are lots of other things I'm not showing. Memory controllers are extremely area and power expensive. You know, network interfaces, same thing, right? And so the problem here is that, you know, the, the, basically the compute, the, the cores on this chip are just a spec, okay? And, and then they're completely dominated by everything else. So that's not a great design, uh, at least from a TCO and, and, and an energy perspective, right? Now, an alternative organization is uh, Telera. Again, just out of curiosity, anybody heard of Telera? Uh, more pe a lot more people, that's interesting. Okay, so they've been around for a lot longer though. So, okay, so Telera, you know, historically started with media network processing. Recently, they started pushing into the scale-out space. So they basically have a many core approach, okay? So lots of simple cores, Telera is MIPS. Uh, Calcetta was ARM, right? This is not fundamental. So many lean cores, great. Now we have a chip that can actually exploit this, you know, massive request level parallelism in a really natural fashion. This is the good news. There are some bad news, okay? So Telera also has, and, and they're really proud of this and they advertise, a very large distributed last level cache, right? So not only is, you know, a large fraction of the chip essentially dedicated to cache, and we saw that large caches are not beneficial, but in order to take advantage of this large cache, right, so, so kind of waste of space, this is a cartoon, uh, but uh, you need a communication mechanism to, you know, allow all of the cores to talk to all of the distributed cache banks, okay? And so Telera uses, you know, a, a really good state-of-the-art on-chip interconnection network. It, 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 it's, you know, it's state-of-the-art. It, it, it's excellent. You know, this is sort of their prominent selling feature. Uh, the problem is, you know, it's a multi-hop interconnect, so to go from point A to point B, you know, you traverse a bunch of routers, each one introduces delay and energy overheads, right? And so this turns out to be a scalability bottleneck, especially in future technologies, as you add more and more cores, and wires are scaling really poorly, right? So this is a source of significant delay, and as I'll show shortly, this turns out to be a performance hindrance. Okay, so with that in mind, with that in mind, sort of we said, you know, there's a bunch of products, they all have their significant shortcomings. Can we actually build something that is specific to these workloads in the best possible fashion? Did you have a question? So, so just to the details about Calera. Yep. Um, so the cores don't have any visibility into which bit of the cache lives near them and which don't offer cache. Uh, so yeah. so Telera has mechanisms, and, and I don't fully understand them, um, where you can basically partition the cache. Okay, but if you partition the cache, you're, what you're basically saying is these cores can access, you know, these blocks and those cannot, and it's not really clear exactly how that's done. I mean, yeah. Okay, so, 
So our proposal of scale-out processors, which is basically a design methodology uh, that is core independent, right? This is an important point. So you throw us a core and we'll give you the best chip possible uh, in a given technology, you know, for these workloads. Okay, and so there are three components, and I'll talk about each of them in detail, but kind of high-level overview. You know, we're going to get the cache down to exactly the right size to, to prevent sort of area waste on a chip. We'll reduce the delays to LLC by basically partitioning the chip uh, uh, in, 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 in islands. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll intentionally not interconnect the islands, uh, essentially enabling us technology scalability. Okay, and I understand this is kind of a lot of stuff on one slide. I'll go through each of these in detail. So the first step is really simple, uh, and, and it should now be fairly obvious at this point. So we're just going to eliminate sort of all of the unnecessary cache capacity, uh, basically turning that into additional compute resources within the same area by chip. Now, naturally, this will consume more power. Of course, you know, burn more power than, than cache, but it turns out that this is actually really beneficial uh, at a data center level from a TCO perspective. Okay, not, not, not the higher power, more cores on the chip. So uh, the second step is to form pods in order to reduce distance. Pods is our term for you know, something like an island, where basically instead of having to communicate over a very large distance, what we'll do is we'll do a natural thing. You know, how do you shrink the distance? Well, you, know, you have fewer things talking to each other. So we're going to have our you know, right-sized cache, and we'll have just a handful of cores, not you know, hundreds of cores around that. right? But of course, you know, I said earlier that what we want to do is we want to have many core processors to amortize all of this other expense, memory controllers, glue logic, you know, network interfaces, all of that other stuff. So what we're going to do is we're now going to take this pod, right, and we'll just replicate it uh, across the chip, you know, as, as a really kind of coarse grain building block to fill out the chip to our available, you know, area power, uh, memory bandwidth budget. Now, one of the questions that naturalizes is, you know, this, you know, this, this is great, but how do you actually figure out what's the right size pod, right? And it turns out that, you know, this is an optimization problem, right? And not, not, not exactly, sort of, there's no obvious answer here, right? So kind of in, in this very cartoonish fashion, what I'm showing here is on the left hand, we have kind of this configuration where we have just a couple of cores that are sharing the cache, right? And so intuitively, this is not great because, again, we have this expensive area-wise cache. Uh, and we just have too few, too few cores to amortize the expense. The other extreme is, you know, basically the Telera configuration. It's, it's, it's the extreme, right, the whole chip. And so we have the distance problem. And so clearly we want something in the middle, but how do we know what it is and how do we generalize this concept uh, so that, you know, it's not core specific, not technology specific. We need a metric, okay? And so our metric is performance density. And so I have a little cartoon that shows this, but I'll have a data in just a few slides that actually shows that you know, real chips, uh, 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 you know, benefit from, from, from this performance and, and follow the trends you'll see here. Okay, so, you know, intuitively, as I start with, you know, one or a few cores and increase the number of cores at some point, and it may be a very large number of cores, but at some, at some point, I will see degraded performance per core, assuming that I'm keeping my cache, uh, um, capacity constant, right? And so this happens for two reasons. One is we have just a lot of cores, you know, beating on the same cache, uh, and so they're competing, contending, right? And so that's causing performance loss. It turns out that's not very significant. Uh, what's really killing performance in very large, uh, you know, many, many core configurations is uh, the wire delays in the communication distance uh, to this last level cache, right? Now, performance loss, you know, is unfortunate, but, you know, for many of these applications, up to a certain point, that can be tolerated because, you know, our aim is higher overall throughput, right, within KOS bounds. So, you know, we look at performance per chip and we see that, you know, initially it starts to scale really well, almost ideally, right, but then it begins to level off and kind of hits this flat asymptote where the um, per core performance degradations basically cancel out the improvement we get from adding more cores, okay? And so the metric that sort of nicely captures these two competing uh, trends is performance density, which is performance per millimeter squared, which let me try to intuit in the following fashion, right? So, so we start out with our cache, right? And that's, you know, potential a dozen or a few dozen millimeters squared, depending on the technology, right? So, so it's kind of a chunk of uh, uh, area. And we start out with, you know, one or two of these really simple small cores. The cache completely dominates the area. The distance is small, so per core performance is great, but our performance density, which is performance per unit area, 
is real, you know, not great because the area is dominated by the caches. Okay, we start throwing more cores at the problem, right? While we ha still have, you know, modest number of cores, distance effects are modest, contention effects are modest, right? So we're growing the area with additional cores, but we're scaling the performance almost linearly, and so performance gains are offsetting the increase in the area, and so performance density is going up. At some point, we've added enough cores that we've basically dwarfed the area of the caches. Okay, so now the area is largely dominated by the cores. Distance effects begin to kick in. Performance starts to kind of diminish or flatten out, right? And so now we start to go down in this performance per millimeter squared curve, right? And obviously what we want are configurations where we amortize the cache over significant number of cores, and yet, you know, the distance effects are modest. Right, and so that's the peak performance density, and this is the configuration we want. Now, clearly, you know, the exact number of cores and the exact amount of cache varies on the exact, you know, microarchitectural parameters, technology parameters, but it's not to do, it, it's, it's not difficult to do, I mean, worst case scenario, a brute force sweep of different configurations, and that's actually what we do to find the configuration that works best. Now, I, I know this is a little abstract and it's a cartoon, but again, I'll show data in just a few slides that basically speaks to this extent. So now that we formed our optimal pod designs, again, as I've said earlier, we just replicate these pods, okay? And so a fundamental optimization, kind of a radical feature of this design is that the pods are not interconnected, right? These are not communicating clusters, communicating on a chip, right? These are really fully independent servers on the chip. Each one runs its full software stack, OS image, right? And so they're intentionally not connected, and so this is great because now we can really truly just ride the technology scaling thing. We don't have to worry about global wires on chip not scaling. We don't have to re-architect our coherence protocol because we have too many cores and the old protocol doesn't support that, right? We just dial, right? So really, really simple, in tune with the scale out model, right? You just add nodes. Okay, so, you know, I'll present a few results at this point. There's lots of stuff, uh, a lot more if you read the papers. What I want to point out is that, uh, let's see, we're targeting 20 nanometer technology node for the evaluation. We're assuming ARM Cortex A15-like cores. We don't have the cores, we don't have their super detailed parameters, but we did the best to model those. So they're about three-way, you know, out of order, nothing like a Xeon, much smaller, two gigahertz frequency. Uh, we have fixed constraints. Maybe this speaks to your question. So all of our evaluated chips have the same constraints, fixed die area, fixed power budget, fixed bandwidth. However, that's not to say that they all hit this constraint, right? So there's a constraint that limits all of them, but for some it may be the area, for others it may be the power, right? But they're all, none of them exceed these constraints. At the data center level, 20 megabyte power budget, high density racks, 64 gigabytes of memory per server. What's really expensive is, that, uh, what's really important is that the number of nodes, number of sockets per server node is determined by the available power budget. So for something like a Xeon, it's a couple of sockets. For something like the small chip, Calcetta design, it's dozens of sockets. Okay. Yes, of course. So for those pods running this, the whole stack? Yep, the yep. And they're sharing some memory channels. Mm -hmm. Do they each have a partition of the memory, or do they have, or is there some kind of read-only sharing of the memory? So right, so that's a great question. So, so right now we're basically assuming private memory, right? It's, it's a separate OS, right? So there's a natural... Uh, uh, sort of, not, not pushback, but, but you know, there's an unfortunate side effect, which is that uh, that means that, you know, essentially you require sharding at the single node level, right, uh, which is, you know, not a fundamental constraint. Something we're looking at right now, and we've been talking to Dushant about, is actually finding ways to share the memory among the nodes, right? But that's, you know, right now the memory is circulate partition. Okay, so first, Pod design, given, given the parameters I just showed you, right, so the, the specific core market architecture technology, what does a pod look like? So the x-axis is the number of nodes that we can integrate, the y-axis is performance density, and so what we see is, you know, these lines, which are actual performance density numbers for this technology, follow the shape that I showed on the cartoon, right? As we add more cores, uh, and, and, and the different lines, by the way, are different cache configurations, right? And so for all of the cache, capacities, we see that as we add cores, initial performance density goes up, hits a peak, and then starts to diminish, you know, kind of beyond 32 cores, right? And in fact, again, for these parameters, 32 happens to be the sweet spot with four megabytes of cache, 
And so we assume that this is our optimal pod. Now, sort of the, the, the real important results will come in the next slide, which is kind of data center level performance TCO comparison of the different designs. However, what I want to point out is that, remember, what we're saying is that the tile design of today's available choices off the shelf, this is kind of the one that's best, right, of the available stuff off the shelf. And so what we're saying is really broken with this design are two things. A, there's too much cash, right, and you're better off devoting this area to the cores. And second, you have these killer wire, wire delays. So in order to sort of drive this point home and show that, you know, there's truth to what we're saying, what we've done is we cooked up uh, uh, a hypothetical design called Tiled Optimal that has, that, that we, you know, we use the same kind of optimization methodology as we do for scale out our design where we found out the optimal number of cores and cache on the chip, which is the same as for scale out, right? But instead of having multiple pods, uh, it's, it's a single sort of large, uh, uh, you know, chip wide pod, right? So potentially you have a request going from a core on one, in one corner of a chip to a cache bank in the opposite corner. So this is not a potted design. So this shows the area. The area is the same, and it's normalized to the Xeon, by the way, uh, but, but I'm not showing that here. Uh, so three, se three sets of bars show the area for the cores, the caches, and uh, all of the other logic, like memory controllers and so forth. And so we see that you know, scale-out design has a lot more cores, and, uh, and the number is in, in, in low hundreds. I don't remember the exact number. OK. So this is, this is great. How does the performance compare? And so here, what I'm showing is the actual you know, throughput per chip normalized to the tile design. So this is performance improvement, right? Tile design doesn't have a performance of zero. It's just that the other ones improve on it. Um, and so what you see is that, A, the tiled optimal design, just by devoting more area to the cores, despite the fact that it has less cache capacity, is able to dramatically improve by about 30% uh, the throughput per chip, okay? But what's really interesting is that the scale-out configuration, which has the same exact number of cores, same exact amount of cache, right? It's essentially the same thing, but now potted, and so it eliminates this wire delay bottleneck, is able to get another 30% over this tiled optimal design, right? But compared to sort of your off-the-shelf processor, it's about a 60% 60% performance improvement, right? Same technology, right? We're not doing anything, you know, incredible here. It's just doing things smarter. Yep. When, when, when they have a shared cap, right? Um, I, don't, I don't know how to adapt it. You have the option to have um, I.O. and memory uh, controllers far fewer than the number of cores. Mm -hmm. But things like you would be I.O. and memory controllers. Right, right. So, so um, no, so what we're assuming is that uh, uh, I.O. and memory is shared, and so this, this, again, is similar to the question that was asked. So we assume that physically, kind of memory and I.O. are shared, right? And so the interfaces are also shared, right? However, for example, with memory, the, uh, the physical address space is partitioned, right? So the hypervisor will basically set this up, and so you have shared, you know, set of DIMMs, your shared physical memory, but only a fraction of it is used by each pod. Okay. Now, you know, in terms of, in, I mean, I, I can tell you what we do for next, but I mean, that, that, you know, we, we essentially present, there are multiple IPs, right, and whether or not you choose to virtualize a single NIC as multiple IPs or have multiple NICs is, is orthogonal, but again, you know, this technology exists, this is, this is not. Does that, does that answer the question? Okay. Okay, cool. So now kind of, you know, what, what, you know, show me the goods type of thing, right? So what does this all mean at the data center level? So I'm going to show three things. TCO performance and performance per TCO at the data center level. We use an academic tool called EETCO that was recently published um, last year. You know, it's an academic tool. It has limitations, but it does really try to capture a lot. And we work with these guys, so we know what they're doing. It really tries to capture, you know, things like, uh, you know, cost of the land, cost of the building, you know, cost of labor, energy costs, and so forth. So it tries to be as comprehensive as possible uh, based on available numbers, okay? And so, you know, when we look at TCO for these different designs, the differences are small. 
right? Yeah, it's, it's you know, one design is you know, maybe 15% more expensive, the other one is 15% cheaper. This is you know, fairly intuitive because really all we're playing with is the processor design, right? Lots of expenses. Processors are expensive. They're a big source of expense, and that's why you do see some degree of variability, but it's not huge, okay? Because you know, processors are just one of many, many expenses. However, when we look at performance, we see that the processor choice has dramatic effect on performance, right? I'm not going to dwell, dwell in performance by itself because, you know, sort of the differences in TCO are small. And so I'm just going to sort of jump to performance per TCO with the understanding that, you know, the, the, the solid blue bars are largely dominated by the performance numbers, not the TCO numbers. Okay. And sort of what I want to highlight is the general trend, right? When we go from a conventional to a small chip design, our performance per TCO improves. Why does this happen? Remember, the, the, the cores in the small chip, as is the case in other designs, are really you know, weak, right? They're, they're not really these powerful cores. But what happens is when we look at the data center level, the fact that you know, the, the cores are really energy efficient, the chips are low power, you can shove a lot more compute, right? A lot more hardware threads in a fixed power budget. And so your aggregate data center level, uh, data center throughput can grow substantially within the fixed power budget. This is the thing to keep in mind. Sort of what we're constrained by in this evaluation is the power budget, okay? Now, we see that going from a small chip design to a tile design gets us yet another performance boost, which is, you know, really considerable. We're almost doubling our performance per TCO over the small chip design. And the reason goes back to, you know, the argument for why small chip is, is you know, not desirable in the first place, which is that you have very little compute on each die, and you have lots of other stuff that you know costs you money, right? And that's why the small chip design TCO wise turns out to be most expensive because the number of chips you have to buy is astronomical, okay? But it also burns power. And so the power to actual processing is dominated by all of this other stuff you have on the chip. Right, and so when you go to a tiled mini core design, you're better able to amortize all of this other stuff, right? And so you end up with fewer chips, right? And the chips are more efficient, right? And then we, when you go from a tiled design, kind of extrapolating, you know, leveraging the same, uh, uh, the same phenomenon, you know, even better integration, smarter integration, and higher performance per chip, you know, for the reasons I talked about in the last slide, we get another 15% performance per TCO boost, right? So looking at today's designs, having a performance per TCO of one, we see that, you know, scale out design, and I want to stress, this is completely off the shelf technology, right? You can get, you know, 7x uh, performance per TCO win. This is an academic exercise. I understand that sort of there, you know, the, 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 the error bars are fairly high, but you know, what should hopefully be convinced of is that even with you know, fairly considerable error bars, there's a lot of benefit from, to be had from really reconsidering the processor organization. Okay, so, um, so that's kind of the, the high level stuff. I wanna spend a few minutes, uh, and I think we're okay on time, uh, kind of talking a little bit about how do you actually design this thing, okay? So, so there's a small microarchitectural component here, but I'll keep this really high level sort of what I want to underscore is we've actually thought about not just, you know, the high level picture, you know, just put in better cores, we've actually thought about how do you organize each of these pods, you know, how would you actually build this to hit this performance density peak that we envision, okay? And it turns out that you can actually do this uh, in, a, in a performance and cost effective fashion, okay? So again, what we're focusing on is how to actually build, you know, what is the microarchitecture of a single pod with the understanding that the pods are just going to be replicated beyond that point. <clears throat> okay, so, so we understand that we need a pod, right? And so the question is, what does this pod actually look like, you know, cartoon notwithstanding, right? And so, you know, let's start with the baseline. And so our baseline is gonna be tiled. Now you're gonna say, aha, but you just told us tiled is bad. But remember, we said, you know, what's really killing you is this, you know, really large distance wire delays. But a pod is a small entity. We're not going to increase the size of the pod. We're just going to replicate the pods. So the wire delays inside each pod are not really that terrible, right? So this is not an unreasonable organization, right? So we're going to have a Tilera-like design, but just small, right? So, so a handful of cores, you know, a few dozen, 32, 64, depending on the core type, right? Uh, mesh interconnect, again, this is what Tilera does. 
And so this is really simple to design, right? You already have a startup started by a bunch of graduate students from MIT, but whatever. Yep. It's actually the routers uh, in addition to the wires. And that's, that's the problem here. It's the routers, not just the wires. But it's not clear to me what you think the traffic over these long wires is. I mean, the memory controllers and the IO controllers are by necessity at the edge of the die. It, it, it's, it's, so it's the, yeah. You're not, you're not saving talking to the memory. Right. Like yep. So what is it that you think you're saving? Excellent question. Excellent question. So, so the real bottleneck, it turns out, is the instruction instruction fetch. So the instruction footprint is in megabytes, okay? So it's totally in the last level cache. Uh, the miss rate, and I can actually show you real data from the uh, hardware evaluation that we did and I talked about earlier. Um, but it turns out that the uh, L1 uh, instruction miss rates are really high. I mean, it's really difficult to even compare it to any other workload domain that I'm aware of where the miss rates are so high. And that's because the data sets are really large. Right, and so what ends up happening is you constantly so go. Sorry, yep. The data sets large, being large, causes a high instruction cache miss rate. Yeah, yeah. So you miss in the L1i a lot, right? But, but the data set, which is you know, it will be in the data cache. Why is that causing L1 instruction misses? No, no. These are two separate things. So, so, so the core does two things. It, it processes instructions, and, and the instructions get the data. Right. Yep. So, so in order to process the instructions, we have to get the instructions, right? Okay, so we. But I can have an algorithm that runs a very large data set that fits perfectly within our own cache. So I don't see how these two things are related. So, 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 so I can tell you that the workloads we're looking at, right, the scale-out workloads, the, 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 the instruction set doesn't come even close to fitting in the L1i, right? It fits perfectly in the last level cache. That's true, right? Okay. Great. Sorry, so, so, so remember, when you have an instruction miss, you are done. Your processor is stalled, right? There is no technique that will cover that instruction miss, right? So this is where the on-chip communication delays become, you know, imperative is because... No, no, there's no assumption. There's no assumption. We have hard data. So, so your processor is stalled because you took an L1i miss. It's, it's not a broadcast. It, it, goes, it, it goes and accesses a remote cache bank. Right, so that's the thing that you're assuming that causes a time processor to be bad. Exactly. Right, that was what I wanted to draw. Oh. Okay, it's quite possible to build a time processor that doesn't do that, but it causes a time processor that does that. Uh, so you're assuming that the time processor is bad. Sure, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, maybe so, but that's what I was trying to draw. I was trying to draw what is your assumption about where the badness is coming from. So you're assuming the thing you're saying is bad is if you take an L1 miss, Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Now I understand what you're asking about. Right. But, but I mean, this is, in fact, what's happening, right? This is not an assumption. This is essentially what's happening. Can you build a better tiled processor? Yes. In fact, that's what we're trying to do, right? This is a better tiled processor. But, uh, but I mean, if you use a Telera off the shelf, that's what will happen. So. So, so look, hold on one second. I mean, if it's an instruction, the DRAM controller has nothing to do with, right? You have a ton of cores in the chip, right? At the end of the day, what do you do to optimize for everybody? You put the instructions in the middle of a chip. In that case, you're cutting your delays in two. No better than that. That's it. But you're assuming here, the reason for the broadcast is that you're assuming that you've got, you've got an instruction cache there. Uh-huh. Somebody else has got that instruction in their instruction cache. So that's why you're broadcasting. Not the instruction cache, the last level cache. We're not broadcasting. We're saying which, so, so this is not an instruction cache, right? The instruction cache is in the C block. The, the orange stuff is the distributed last level cache. So what used to be the monolithic chunky thing in a conventional thing is distributed architecture here. Okay. But in fact, stick with me because I think what we're going to end up doing is really, really philosophically similar to what you have in mind. Okay? 
So, so I agree. I mean, you have to. This is the problem, and you have to fix this. Yes. Please. So, uh, I mean, I know this. You know, the, the instruction casting this stuff is based on on the work that was done that you did. But how much of that do you think is is related to uh, you know software level implementation technologies? Because um, you know the instruction caches on cores are you know, reasonable size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Missing instructions. Sure. And, you know, if you implemented them, you know, in, in a slightly lower level thing, then, you know, they would probably fit perfectly. So, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, do, do, why do you think hardware is the way to tackle this rather than, you know, educating people to write their algorithms in such a way that they fit into the instruction cache? I mean, I, I yeah. cannot imagine an algorithm that wouldn't, you know, the core of the compute kernel, which wouldn't fit so, into Right. So, so, so I have two comments. So, so you know, A, I, I personally am not sure if maybe for a couple of these applications like, like real industrial grade search, I've been led to believe that the instruction footprints are actually really big, right? Uh, but, um, you know, I, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of crud and, you know, the stack is really, you know, tall, deep, whatever the hell you want to call it, right? And so you have, like you said, JVM, PHP, you know, your database, right? And so you have all of these layers. I mean, can you rewrite it from scratch in assembly? Yeah, sure. Is this what people do? Absolutely not. Are they going to change tomorrow? Definitely not. But people want better chips, right? And so I think education is the way to go. Right. So, 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 look, so again, I agree with you. I have no idea if you can write your, you know, search, web serving, you know, whatever that will fit in the 32 or 64 kilobyte L1i fully. I can just give you one example. So, our benchmark with the smallest instru working instruction set. Is, is media streaming, right? It's dumb, right? All it's doing is it's just fetching data from memory, packing it up into packets, you know, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, communication protocol to figure out when to send, when to back off, when to resend, right? It's really simple, okay? That thing is thrashing in the L1 like crazy because you're going from really simple application level processing to really simple, you know, uh, OS processing, basically doing the TCP IP stuff, right? It's thrashing. Linux is thrashing the application. Application is thrashing Linux. Things don't get much simpler than that because you don't have multiple layers of software. You have your C code and you have your Linux code. And they're still killing each other, right? Things don't get simpler than that. I mean, yeah, if you rewrite your OS and you rewrite everything, I think you can do amazing and there's great research to be done there. I just don't know how realistic that is. So, okay. So, so again, so that was a really good point. I want to thank you for that because, right, most of the optimization is centered around optimizing the instruction fetch because the data you're already going from memory, you know, and adding 40 cycles to a 200 cycle memory access is painful, but, you know, it, it's not that painful. It's really the instructions that are killing you. I should have made that clearer. Thank you very much. So I, do we have a few extra minutes or how are we doing? Sure. Okay. Uh, th there's really not much left here. So, so anyways. So we start with the style design, right? So the wire distance is not big, but what hurts is actually the, the routers, right? So each router, we're reading the pa you know, writing, uh, we're writing a packet buffer, reading the packet buffer, arbitrating, flow control, switch, right? And so this eats, to, uh, eats into our latency, right? But this is really you know, cheap, easy to build, right? Very simple router. Okay, now the question is, does this really matter or not? Right? And so what we've done here is we've compared our sort of tiled mesh design to an ideal where the ideal is just the wires, right? No router overhead. Everything is the same except now we have wires and the wires have a delay and so they contribute to performance loss and that's what the dash, uh, the dot, the dash line is showing, okay? And then the solid lines 
our everything is the same, but now we have a router at each hub. And so what you'll see is as you get into pods with you know, larger number of cores, which we're claiming is kind of around the optimal, depending on your core microarchitecture, you know, there's 18, 20% or so performance loss compared to your ideal design, right? It's not a 7x factor, but you also don't want to leave this on the table, right? And so the question we're trying to answer is, can you actually bridge this gap and get us the maximum performance from this pod? And so, you know, if the performance are the routers and it's just, you know, it comes down to the network, then, you know, we'll just put in, you know, industrial strength, really high performance network, right? And, you know, there's research literature you can draw on. And so the state of the art uh, sort of on-chip interconnect is a flattened butterfly, okay? And uh, the idea here is to exploit the abundant on-chip wiring resources to richly interconnect everything, right? So this is kind of a little bit of a mess, but basically what happens is each core is fully connected in both X and Y dimensions, in the row and the column, right? So each core has a dedicated channel, dedicated link to its adjacent neighbor and to all of the other nodes, okay? And so we do this for the entire chip, and of course this ends up being a fairly, you know, wire channel intensive exercise with really beefy routers, lots of ports, right? And so this turns out to be really area intensive, right? And in fact, it turns out that, you know, for 32 or 64, I can't remember the exact data point, uh, cores, this has about 7x the cost of the mesh interconnect I showed earlier, okay? And this turns out to be a lot of areas I'll show in a few slides. But this has fantastic performance, largely bridging the gap between uh, uh, the mesh and the ideal interconnect, right? Because any hop is just two router traversals, right? One hop in one dimension, one hop in another dimension. You're done. So that's great, but this turns out to be a really high performance design. And so the question we asked is, you know, can we actually get us the ideal, right? Low cost, low latency. And so sort of what's really important, and this is kind of what I want to drive home from, from this part of the talk, is, you know, we have to optimize for the data pattern. And then again, I'm answering your, your question is, you know, where, you know, where is the traffic going? What's really happening? Well, we're two types of data accesses. We have code, which is in the last level cache, and data in the memory. What's really important to realize is that there is no reuse in the L1s. In other words, we go to the last level cache, and if the data is not there, it's guaranteed to be in memory. We don't have situations, or at least it's really rare, when somebody has a modified piece of data, and so the directory at the last level cache says, no, 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 the data is somewhere else on the chip, and it forwards the request, and so you have this multi-hop protocol to get the updated data value. That almost never happens, okay? And so basically the data access pattern is what we call bilateral. It's L1 to the last level cache, not L1 to other cores L1s, right? Well, what does this mean? Why does this really matter? Is when you look, you know, data access is bilateral, cores to the last level cache, but the traffic pattern, flattened butterfly or mesh, is all to all because the cache is distributed, right? So a single core, you know, over time ends up making requests all over the chip to the different distributed banks of the last level cache, okay? And so in order to get the performance to where we need it to be, the ideal, we end up paying a lot in cost for really rich all to all interconnect. And so the, the, the fundamental observation we're making, and this is kind of what I want to sort of drive home, this is kind of the cool optimization, is that what we want to do is we want to re-engineer this so that our data access pattern matches the traffic pattern, or the traffic pattern matches the data access pattern. And so the fundamental observation is that we're gonna put the LLC in the middle. Remember, this is not in the middle of the die. This is simply in the middle of the pod, right? And so what this allows us to do, we're decoupling the cache banks from the cores. And now what we can do is we can basically limit the communication to a subset of nodes, right, while still preserving full software connectivity, you know, compatibility, it's a shared memory, blah, blah, right, the support sharing, uh, and reduce cost, okay? So, you know, here's what, what really happens. First, we're gonna decouple the cores and the tile, uh, and the caches, you know, we went from a mess to an even bigger mess now, okay, but this is just the starting point. All we're doing is we're, trying to optimize for the traffic pattern. Now, because the cache is separate from the cores, we don't need the core-to-core -core links. All we need to do is talk to the cache. So now we can eliminate a great number of these links, okay? And so now we've gone from this mess to this mess, which is 
a hell of a lot smaller with virtually no loss in performance. And now what we have is essentially dedicated links from each core to each of the caches with a rich interconnect among the cache banks. And we can do better than that by basically saying each core does not need a dedicated link to each of the cache banks, and so we can fold them, and we end up with a really cheap topology. Really cheap, right? So these end up being very simple. I'll show that in a second. And so there's an expensive uh, flattened butterfly interconnect in the middle, but it's limited to just a fraction of the die. And so those that can stomach two microarchitectural slides, what I want to show is we, have, we end up having three types of networks. We have the request network, where the requests flow from the cores to the cache banks. And those end up being, you know, this is a tree. These are just moxes, right? We have a local port and a network port, and the requests get merged, and they float over the cache. And so that's really cheap. It's a buffered arbitrated mox. And then we have a reply network, where the data replies travel from the cache to the cores, and that time ends up being just as cheap. You know, it's an arbitrated buffered demultiplexer, right? So that's really simple. And so our final network, you know, is just that. We have this expensive middle part and really cheap rest of the chip. And so when we look at the area breakdown, what we see is that you know, our, we call this knockout, our, you know, proposed design. The flattened butterfly ends up being really expensive, 25 millimeters squared, almost 24, I think, or something, right? This is a really expensive piece of engineering, right? Knockout actually ends up being even cheaper than the mesh, just a few millimeters squared. So this is easy to stomach, right? But in terms of the performance, we see that both flattened butterfly and knockout reach, you know, almost the ideal network's performance, about 18% improvement over a mesh, at roughly one tenth the cost. Okay. So, you know, just to summarize, you know, data centers, really expensive, lots of memory uh, to, to keep the workloads, uh, sorry, the workload data in memory, right? So what we need to do is optimize for, you know, for performance, right? How can we get the most bang from this memory investment, right? How can we get the most throughput, right? So scale-out processor is kind of a near-term big efficiency boost using off-the-shelf technologies, just better and smarter, right? Longer term, kind of, our vision is integrate, specialize, and, and really far out, approximate. So that, that's pretty much it. Uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Any additional questions? Yeah? Do you preserve um, semantics for software? So in other words, you, you say these traffic action patterns are very rare, but you right. L1, L1. Yes. But no, 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 they're, they're fully preserved. I'm really happy you asked this question. I didn't want to get into this. So, right, so, so here's what happens. So, so the, the cache organization, you know, it's shifted. They used to be here distributed. Now it's in the middle. But it's basically the same thing. It's still multiple separate banks, and it's still there's a directory controller. And so what happens is if it turns out, so you have shared memory, and turns out that, you know, somebody holds the lock, right, or whatever, right? So somebody has the data you need. So what happens is, you know, your request travels to the directory there, the directory does the lookup, and will forward the request to the cache that actually has it, and it goes back through the cache. So what we lose on is the optimization where the core could potentially forward the request directly to you, and if the core is adjacent, you reduce the latency, right? So now everything goes around, and so this is clearly, this would not be good for, let's say, high-performance computing, scientific apps. This would be bad, right? But this is the, uh, the, the trade-off. Right, these cases are rare, and so that's okay. So, wait, 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 wait. If your proposed use case is both that's got the instructions anyway, you're not like Exactly. So it's in it's it's here, not here, precisely. Yeah. Maybe, um, sure. Let's take one last question. Uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Boris will be here for the rest of the day, so if you're not already eating him and you'd like to sort of have more discussion, then you know, or or just call me and I'll try to Right. You, you have many, many outstanding transactions. Right. That's, that's, yeah. Do you have additional latencies because of fair, fair, fair question. Fair question. So, so again, because, you know, the, we're optimizing for a really specific set of workloads, right? So we actually did measurements, right? So how much memory traffic are they generating? And so we, uh, uh, we put as many memory controllers as are, as are necessary. Now, memory, it turns out that for these really simple energy efficient cores, 
in future technology, especially if you don't use like the out of order E15, if you use something like the A8 in order core, it turns out that memory bandwidth will be the bottleneck, right? So, so I don't remember the exact numbers, but I mean, you basically, even with optimistic assumptions on DDR4, right, we run out of memory bandwidth, right? So yeah, this is, uh, this is totally constrained. It, it's a well-known one, but uh, yeah. But, but we do assume, we optimize the number of memory controllers based on memory uh, demands placed by, by the workloads.